Thank you all so much for being here. We have a couple of things to get going up front. So, the University of British Columbia envisions a climate in which students, faculty and staff are provided with the best possible conditions for learning, researching and working, including an environment that is dedicated to excellence, equity and mutual respect. The University of British Columbia strives to realize this vision by establishing employment and educational practices that respect the dignity of individuals and make it possible for everyone to live, work and study in a positive and supportive environment, free from harmful behaviors such as bullying and harassment. We encourage you to read more about UBC's respectful environment statement on UBC's HR website. We acknowledge that the UBC Vancouver campus is situated on the traditional, ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam, and we respectfully acknowledge the Silks Okanagan Nation and their peoples in whose traditional, ancestral, unceded territory UBC Okanagan is situated. We also acknowledge that when we meet virtually, we come together from many different territories. I encourage you to think deeply about those three words, traditional, ancestral, and unceded. They're a key part to reconciliation, and I further encourage you to read the Truth and Reconciliation Report and understand, uh, understand and implement to the best of your ability the 94 calls to action contained within that report. And we encourage you to reflect on your individual privileges that have afforded you the opportunity to be here this week and how they may differ from the experiences of others. In doing so, we contribute to fostering an inclusive climate for events based around a shared respect for the ways in which we are different and importantly, for the ways in which we are the same. Okay, let's move on to our panelists for today. In no particular order, other than Elisa going first because she's my boss's boss, Dr. Elisa Baniasad is the Acting Academic Director for the Center for Teaching, Learning and Technology at UBC Vancouver. She is a Killam Teaching Prize winner, Director of the Institute for Scholarship of Teaching and Learning at UBC, Institutional Co-Lead for the Center for the Integration of Research into Teaching and Learning and Teaches Software Construction and Software Engineering for the Department of Computer Science at Vancouver, UBC Vancouver. Dr. Raymond Lawrence is the Academic Director for the Center for Teaching and Learning at UBC Okanagan. He is Director of the Distributed Database Laboratory, the founder of Unity JDBC, and the Professor of Computer Science at UBC Okanagan. Dr. Faras Musfi is a UBCO Teaching Fellow and UBCO Teaching Excellence and Innovation Award-winning lecturer, now at Computer Science Department at UBC Vancouver. He is a multidisciplinary educator, deeply interested in researching how learning technologies can enhance teaching and learning. Dr. Joss Ives is a UFV Faculty of Science Teaching Award-winning Associate Professor of Teaching at the Department of Physics and Astronomy at UBC Vancouver. His research interests include assessments that support learning, including two-stage group exams. And last but most certainly not least, Mr. John Festinger Casey is a lawyer, author and adjunct professor at the Peter A. Allard School of Law at UBC Vancouver. He is a faculty in residence at the Emerging Media Lab, director and past chair of Viasport BC, a huge advocate of open in every sense of the word pedagogically, and in a previous life was senior vice president of the CTV television network and executive vice president of business and general counsel of the Vancouver Canucks, Go Canucks Go, and the arena in which they played, uh, General Motors Place. While at CTV, he launched VTV, Vancouver Television, and was the station's first general manager. <clears throat> On behalf of everybody uh, here in the audience, Thank you all so very much for being here. I know we are all genuinely thrilled and very excited to hear about your experiences with Gen AI and tech in general, using them in your classroom and uh, in your research in general. So for you in the audience, what is this session? What, what are we doing? It's essentially three things, we hope. A way for you to see how your peers and colleagues are using generative AI in their day to days. A space where you can see anonymously how many of your peers and colleagues are at the same point in their Gen AI learning journey as you, and a place to hear about or add to some pieces of tech that we wish the university had access to or maybe would develop. So first off, we're going to ask you all a question in the audience and also the, uh, the panelists too. We're asking this question, it's going to be a poll that we're going to open and I would encourage you, it's not required, but I'm going to encourage you to answer it. It's actually for you. The idea being here that you can see that you're almost certainly not alone in wherever you are in how you feel about Gen AI's impact on the university and where you are on the learning journey of generative AI in general. So I'm gonna open this poll, if I can work it out. And there's four answers. Are you excited? Are you anxious? Both or neither? 
And panelists, heads up, I'm going to ask you this question and then also ask you to explain why you're voting that way. I'm also going to share the results. I'm going to give you sort of 30, 60, 60, 90 seconds, uh, folks in the audience, to answer this. And, uh, and then I'll share the results. And we're going to compare it to a much larger study that was done about six months ago, uh, which in this space, six months is like an entire lifetime. Um, but it, it was a, with 2,000 people. So it'd be interesting to see how, how this particular audience compares. And I'm sort of looking at the early figures, and it's actually pretty close, which is quite interesting. I'm going to give you like another sort of 15, 20 seconds, and then we'll, we'll take a look. OK, the numbers are slowly sort of ebbing down. So let me end this poll and then share the results. With a bit of luck, everyone can see these results. So that's where we're at. So about just about two thirds of us are both anxious and excited. Um, as about 7% are anxious, 16% are excited, and about that the same number, about neither. All right, let's compare that to a larger sample size that was done, uh, yeah, about six months ago, about 2,000 people. Fairly similar, not exactly the same. And I think this might be because this was done six months ago. There was a lot more people who were more anxious than six months ago and have had more opportunity to use these tools and perhaps experience what they're used for and see what their colleagues are doing. And the number of anxious uh, folks has come down, which is interesting. Um, however, the one thing that I'm really keen, and this is basically the end of my particular piece of talking here, because you're not here to see me, is one of the key pieces uh, that I am really interested in is making sure that for everyone that is working in this space, that we listen to those folks who are anxious. We listen to the reasons why they're anxious. And it's, imp it's imperative that we actually ensure that the reasons why they're anxious are considered when we start moving forward with this technology. OK, that's the end. So panelists, in no particular order, other than Alita is first on my screen, how did you vote and why? Right, so I voted both. Um, I think, you know, that's the kind of hedgy answer anyway. Um, but the reason that I said both is that I am super excited. I, you know, I really genuinely feel both of these feelings. I'm genuinely super excited about the changes that it can bring. I'm, you know, whatever the opposite of a Luddite is, I think. Like I just, you know, boldly go into areas of technology in a really excited way always. But this one just seems, I think I have been skeptical about it, but then all of a sudden it was like, well, what am, what am I doing? Why am I being skeptical? The reason I'm anxious is because I do think it's going to have, you know, I think, over years on aggregate, it's going to be pretty amazing. But I feel like the journey to get to the amazing might be quite painful for individuals. Um, and so I'm anxious for individuals. I think I'm I'm excited for the world and for our fields and for, yeah, for us on aggregate. But I think I'm, I'm worried about how this will affect particular people and particular jobs and, um, and that transitional period. So that's why I answered both. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, for us, you're next on my screen. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, so I answered anxious, um, and I would, if I could add a word, it would be anxious and guilty. Uh, not not because of the of the great um, improvements to people's lives is going to bring, but mostly on the the cost of it. Uh, not in terms of money, but in terms of carbon footprint and uh, sustainability and how much water gets used. It was a study done, which I don't really want to quote, but something like a bottle of water. You know, asking ChatGPT a question is equivalent to dumping a bottle of water on the streets based on how much energy it takes to cool these data centers. And so I'm, I'm excited about the research that's coming up that will make these um, large language models less power hungry and less demanding of uh, our world's finite resources. But th there's the anxiety part. And the guilt is, of course, it's so cool. I use it all the time on a daily basis. And I want to balance that against feeling this guilt. But I mean, I, I, I love it. I use it all the time. Uh, I have some reservations on making my students use it. Um, but yeah, that, that's where the anxiety and guilt comes from, for, from my perspective. That's great. Thank you. And I think um, we might ask uh, folks to dig into exactly some of those things later. So I really appreciate you bringing it up. Joss. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm also a both. Um, and I think both the things that uh, Elisa and Fraz said really resonate. Um, I personally find it 
extremely productive. Um, I do a lot of a lot of coding in my work, and and so just uh, its ability to facilitate coding without having to look up a thousand things is is spectacular. I also use it quite a bit in my teaching, um, and so that those are things we'll we'll get into to a bit later. And and you know I am. I'm anxious on the individual's behalves. And, you know, one of the things is I actually have some required assignments in some of my courses that are just in a group work environment where students are actually using generative AI. And I did have a lot of students later throughout the course telling me that, you know, they're really uncomfortable to continue using it. Um, and so I think it'll be interesting to, you know, discuss where some of those feelings are coming from, from the students, because it's not... It's not just their discomfort with interacting with it, but their discomfort on trying to navigate the space of how everybody's expectations are so different as to whether or not it's endorsed or allowed or anything like that. Really interesting. Thanks, Joss. John? Um, I guess I am uh, the unequivocal optimist here. Um, uh, you know, I... I, I'm very positive about it. Um, so a couple of reasons, um, including why I'm not anxious and maybe I'll start there. Um, the, the anxiety that first came to mind is, uh, you know, the, the whole fiction around AI and our robot masters and the end of the world. And, uh, you know, I, I've been, as you mentioned in the introduction, in the corporate sphere uh, for most of my career. Um, and I understand public companies and I understand a little bit about what they're, and I teach corporate law actually here at Allard. Um, so that informs my perspective about what companies are willing to do to hype their stock, which is almost anything. And so I see a lot of what's going on um, uh, in terms of uh, the, the the notion of the bad things AI is going to do as, as, as part of, hey, you know, if we're going to pump the stock, we, we don't care if they, and I've literally heard lots of people in the corporate sphere say this to me during my career. We don't care if they're saying good things or bad things about us, as long as they're talking about us. And, and AI has focused the entire world on talking about AI and AI companies. Uh, the reason I'm optimistic and, and quite optimistic in a, uh, in a learning and teaching context is because working with a couple of uh, AI tools, um, uh, I've, I've seen impacts and positive impacts uh, on students. And I'm going to suggest that, you know, for all that we hear about the magic being in how we prompt AI, I think the true magic, and maybe we'll have a chance to talk about this, um, when we talk about specific tools, is in how AI might prompt us to think more critically or think more laterally or come up with ideas in kind of the negative spaces, the spaces that we don't usually think about that easily. And I think that helps students uh, potentially tremendously and gives them uh, a leg up over previous generations of students if we do it properly. Thanks, John. If only we had a tool to help with that, by the way. Oh, maybe we should talk about something. Uh, <laughs> Raymond. Hi, everyone. I would say positive, uh, both with more positive than negative is where I stand on this. Positive because I think it offers a lot of opportunities. I think we're going to re-envision some of the jobs. So I'm in computer science. We're going to have to rethink what it looks like as a graduate from computer science, what skills they need. And there's many other disciplines that are going to be like that as well. Like how do, what skills do we really need to teach them at university? What assessments are we gonna do? We've started that with COVID and all those technologies and AI is just giving us a bigger push. I'm gonna treat that as a positive. We're gonna try and make something better to make it more engaging, more useful for our students. I don't know if anxious is the right word on the negative, but as an instructor, the problem with that push is you have to respond to that push. So what does that mean of you actually changing your individual courses, your assessments? the work that goes into it. The more you experience AI, the anxious fear goes away. 
but the anxious recognition that you do have to respond, you can't just ignore it, is still going to be there. So how you deal with that, I'm in that boat as many are instructors. We know how we have to respond, but we also know this takes time for us to do it well. Thanks. Well, thank you. I think that was uh, some really interesting approaches, like pretty much across the spectrum, uh, which is kind of reflective of kind of the, the audience and how, what we're seeing in general, which is really fascinating to see. So let's try and think now specifically in terms of your classrooms or on your specific research. Like um, how, how are you addressing the use of generative AI in terms of um, are you having conversations with your students up front? Uh, is there reminders going on? Is it part of your syllabus? Uh, and then maybe think of this is a tech panel after all, what tools are you allowing or encouraging your students to use? Uh, I'm going to start, if you don't mind, with, uh, with Firas. All right, so I'm in a somewhat unique position in that I teach multi large multi-session courses, and so it's not always just my decision <laughs> to decide on what happens in these courses, but um, I, I taught uh, Computer Science 210 this term, and uh, the, the course policy at the moment is that generative AI is just not allowed. It, it explicitly just says you are not allowed to use these tools in this course. Um, and we are trying our best to make sure that our assessments are immune to these kinds of things by having them, uh, having students do them in a computer-based testing facility with, with you know, lockdown computers and things like that. But with 700 students, it's just not possible to do all of that. So that's one uh, one of my courses. I'm teaching a fourth year course this summer uh, that's project based, and that takes the exact opposite approach, which is that you are allowed to use these tools. You just need to cite and let us know, and you're responsible for knowing the content that is produced by these. And when as soon as you generate based on your prompts the code becomes yours and so you are responsible for explaining all aspects of it to a human in our weekly uh, scrums or lab sessions and so that's kind of the opposite approach where you know we know that they're going to use it and we just want to a understand how they're using it where they're using it so that we can respond to it in future by by building in assessments that are more designed to target specific learning outcomes and then two, also just making them be more responsible citizens and, and acknowledging when they're getting help from, from other sources, just like they would from Wikipedia or Google or Stack Overflow, any of the other tools we have allowed in the past. So yeah, sometimes the decisions aren't always in individual instructor's hands, but um, but when they are, uh, I, I would, you know, I don't want to police it because then it's the, the the onus is on me to make sure that that policy is, I don't like having policies that I can't enforce. And I also don't like policies that I have to spend most of my time enforcing. And so we just need to find a, a balance in how to allow students to use it and make sure that it, they know it's okay to use it. But I mean, Joss's point is also very valid is that students, like if one instructor tells them it's cheating to do this, it is weird to hear that another instructor is letting them and in fact encouraging them to use it. And so I think that has to be part of the conversation that has to have, has to be had with students. Josh, do you want to expand on that in terms of uh, the point that was being made or? Oh, no, I mean, I just fully agree that the okay. thing I don't want to do is, is spend the majority of my teaching time trying to enforce policies. Sounds sensible. Do you want Anybody me to go else? while I'm on the mic? Oh, sorry. No, sure, go for it. No, you, you go for it. <laughs> um, okay, so, you know, one of the things I do is uh, I teach a couple of different second year physics courses, a computational physics one and a writing intensive lab course. And, and both of these have in the syllabus kind of a preface that just says, you know, everything in this course that you submit I expect that you've made significant intellectual contributions toward the thing you've submitted. I would not ever assign you something with the intention that you would just go out and do a simple prompt to answer it or go find a solution. So if you are finding that that's the case, that was certainly not the intention of the assignment. So really making sure that the intention is there, but saying, you know, you are absolutely welcome to be using these tools like press, you know, cite what you're doing, those sorts of things. And it's under a larger umbrella of these other things of, you know, getting solutions from other people, finding solutions online, all these other things is holding yourself to uh, accountable to a high standard 
and and really expecting that having that understanding of there's some certain skills that we're working on and some of these things are being assigned to work on those skills and uh, if it feels like you're circumventing working on those skills, then you're probably not engaging with the assessment in an honest way. Some great points. Would anybody of the other panelists like to add to this? John. Uh, so I'll I'll come a little bit, um, <clears throat> and I don't want to misclassify the law, but I'll but I'll, I'll I, I think I'll come at this a little bit from the artsy side of the spectrum where uh, there is, I, I teach a number of essay courses or even exam courses that have other written and, and presentation components. Um, so uh, <clears throat> a couple of things, and, and I think they're fairly consistent, um, but AI is a source and has to be cited as a source and students are responsible for it as a source. Um, and, and so I think that's significant. Secondly, and, and this may be unique to law, um, but uh, AI is, uh, tools are very good in a legal context at form. They're not so strong on substance, but they're very good on form. So as a result of that, I've changed uh, my grading balance uh, away from form and more toward, and it's a, it's that much more geared towards uh, substantive analysis. Um, uh, and I'm very clear, I spend a fair bit of time uh, with students trying to coach them on where AI will be useful to them and where AI will actually uh, get them in trouble because they're not checking citations and AI will not just make up legal citations, but will actually write judgments that are completely false and made up uh, that can fool, um, you know, a student. So that's, uh, that's one place. The other place, the optimistic place is providing tools which really have worked. And I don't know if there's gonna be an opportunity, but we've created a, a tool around moot court, which is the scariest thing that a first year law student goes through um, uh, in, in that year um, and, and a tool that helps them practice for really the most trauma inducing part of first year. Uh, and then a Socrates tool uh, which was algorithmic, but now, um, Rich, you've developed it um, throughout with me, but is now in its kind of AI iteration. And even the algorithmic iteration was very helpful to students in terms of generating ideas and generating um, arguments um, in different legal subjects where we made the tool available. So there's, you know, that's how I teach with it. Fascinating. Thanks, John. Elisa, Raymond, would you like to add to this? Or you can move on to another question. I'll just quickly add something. I think the biggest thing is there's not a one size fits all, but the most important thing is you communicate precisely with your students what you expect with AI, how they can use it, how they shouldn't be using it, and more importantly, why you came up with that decision. As Faraz mentioned, maybe it's not your decision, maybe it's a department decision, but if it's your decision, why is that the case? The worst thing you could do is hide from it. So in my third year database course, I went through all the assessments and most of them, the AI can do exceptionally well. And so what I did last year is I actually showed a solution for assignment one AI live, first class. I said, AI can do this, but if AI can do this and you can't, then the employers are gonna hire AI, not you. So you have a choice, whether you're gonna make it as a learning experience doing these assignments or whether you're just gonna Think you're going to do well but then when the exams come you can't do it because you haven't learned and so that's kind of also changed the focus on what those assignments are they're more very much formative don't like the policing i agree with everybody there i don't think it's actually feasible so it's all about motivation now and trying to encourage them to do it themselves john you know just to add one footnote to this and it's in a pure legal uh pedagogic context um there is one particular thing in my experience and experiences of my colleagues 
that AI does in its current form, I, I, I won't even say doesn't do well, does badly. And it's actually critical to law and the rule of law as we know it. AI doesn't do fairness. Um, and fairness is probably, if you look at any law school curriculum, the single most fundamental contextual piece and normative piece. Um, so in a subject like administrative law, um, immigration law, let's say, where you're making decisions about whether somebody should be in the country or not, that are very multi-context and don't have a linear path because it's all about fundamental fairness. AI just performs very badly in its current form. So um, in, in terms of, I, I couldn't agree more with Ramon, you know, it's very important that I explain that to students, that if you're just giving, um, if, if you're just giving an AI answer, that's about fundamental fairness. You are really risking uh, significantly. I think that's super fascinating. I, I want to dig a bit deeper into how you're seeing your students actually use these things. You're sort of priming them on, on what you don't necessarily want them to do. And sometimes it's just literally because you can't use them at all. But um, I, I really want to dig into sort of how you're seeing uh, students actually use these tools what, once they've been through that sort of initial you know, priming that you've given them. Elisa? Sorry, I'm really slow on the draw with the mute button. Um, so <laughs> yeah, I'm actually not teaching right now, which is, you know, a weird thing. Um, but uh, I've been talking to a lot of educators around how how um, Gen AI is being used in classes and in particular talking to my colleagues in computer science in the courses that I usually teach. So for us teaches a course I usually teach and then um, other colleagues teach other courses I usually teach. So I feel a bit of FOMO, honestly, um, in this stage. But, um, but what I've been hearing a lot, especially about our project in our software engineering course is that um, is that students are dropping lots of code into their projects out of ChatGPT or out of Copilot or whatever. Um, and, you know, what interests me is really the granularity of what people are dropping in. So like in, in coding, you can, you can drop stuff in in a very granular way, like one line at a time, and then you're sort of able to understand what's going on line by line. And that does bring you in on the development process a bit, um, but you can also say, give me a component that follow that that meets these specifications, and then they're dropping whole ones in. And you can really tell, I guess, well, I've seen it. You can really tell when the, where the differences lie at the moment. Of course, ChatGPT and all of these, you know, tools are getting better and better. So for the for now, you can kind of tell um, whether somebody has done this, and it's and it's interesting because I think the interaction mode with when you have asked for a big component and then you try and interact with it at all. Like if there's a bug inside of that large swathe of text that you generated, it's actually really hard to figure out what on earth is going on. Um, it's better if you use the line by line approach, which actually is, is kind of a version of coding. I mean, we're already using line by line transformations when we code because we're asking it to translate things into machine code anyway. So um, that's just compilation. So it's just a different level of, of abstraction of interacting. Um, but that's what I've that's what I've sort of heard is that people are either interacting with it in that granular way or in this big way. And if they interact in the bigger way, it causes them some some problems. Um, and for myself, as like, you know, a parent who's helping their kids study for science tests and math tests. And Rich, I've sent you some of the hilarity that comes out of chat GPT when I try and use my use it to help my child study for things. Um you know, asking it to generate quizzes or like, this is the thing that, you know, I need to be able to um, be tested on. Can you generate me some questions? It's pretty good for some topics. So I can imagine, you know, John, you're shaking your, I can imagine for a lot, it could be pretty dodgy, but computer science, every single thing that's happened since the dawn of computing is on the web. So, you know, the average answer for everything is pretty close to the right answer for everything. Um, so it's, it's quite good. Um, weirdly, it recently got worse at math, as I shared with Rich. It's being very strange these days, but um, 
but yeah, so that's kind of how, how we've been using it. We've been using it to generate study materials and then also wholesale production of content. But, um, but the bigger, the, the bigger, the chunk, the worse off you are, it would seem. Well, one of the things I'll come to you in a second, John, one, one of the things that Alicia showed me yesterday was basically Chad GBT asked a question, Alisa answered it. Mm -hmm. And then it said, oh, not quite, but close, then went through the working out of it and then was like, oh, you got the answer right. You didn't get it right. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I was like, oh, would you look at that? You, I, just, <laughs> like, right. really I did that all day as well. Like that was its whole thing was we would say, is this the answer? And we'd be like, mm, sorry, looks like you still have to work on this topic. And then it would do the example. Let, let's work through it. And then at the end, it'd be like, well, would you look at that? Good on you. You it's, actually did get it correct. It's, it's interesting. New Very it, it, it was in a mood. Right. And it never used to do that. It just used to basically just go, no, you got it wrong. Uh, and, and it wouldn't correct itself. Even if it then showed you that you had got it right, it wouldn't actually correct itself. So that's that's new behavior. But at the same time, it seems to be definitely worse in the math space, which is really interesting. John, you raise your hand. No, let's keep going. It's all good. Well, I'll come to you. It's all good. <laughs> or, or anybody else. Who, who, who would else? Like, how, how are you seeing students use it in your classrooms? Don't know I would just say I think the students are using it way more widely than we give it credit for. There's so many software, so many different tools. I have two university age students and kids, and one of them showed me things. I go, wow, I didn't know that. Maybe I shouldn't be disclosing that. But there are some challenges, and we don't actually know all the tools that the students are using. And because we don't know, we don't have given good guidance on which ones they're going to do. The other thing I'll mention with that is we say AI, but it's a broad spectrum. And what you would say you would and wouldn't accept depends on your course. So as a computer scientist, if you're using Grammarly to improve your writing, I think I'm okay with that for my discipline. But some other writing focused disciplines may not be okay. And then the challenge with that is going to the detection. Are we ever gonna be able to detect it? It's gonna look like spell checking in Word or Google Docs pretty soon. So it is an interesting question. But I'll just say they are using it in more creative ways than you can imagine uh, on sharing things like that. Thanks. So I I, I want to maybe explain why I was shaking my head when Elisa was speaking. Um, when I, I when I put in tests around create a syllabus for me um, or write an exam for me, um, it just comes back. Uh, way too general. And the most disconcerting thing I find, it, it, it just from a uh, from a teacher's perspective, um, about uh, uh, about generative AI that we don't talk about. And and there are a lot of computer scientists here, so there may be a very simple answer, and I'm just not getting it. Um, is the fact that you we can all ask generative AI uh, and the same generative AI the exact same question, and it'll come back differently for all of us. And and I find that extremely disconcerting um, in terms of designing pedagogy. I find it extremely wonderful in terms of prompting students to think and think differently and uh, engage in the adventure of learning because never, you know, never is anything exactly the same way twice, which is exactly what learning should be. And, and so uh, there's kind of two sides to that point that I don't kind of fully grok to. Solid points, especially like I suppose that some of the popular things that have been made the media recently about how different large companies are using these tools and and sort of sort of the traps they've fallen into and um, it's you know it's it's a key thing that we're we're all trying not to fall into those traps but we have to be very aware of it especially in the law John you know a bunch of lawyers using it and they always make the, they always they always make the the news first don't they but it's one of those things okay so we've we've talked about sort of your use cases and we've talked about your students use cases but what about large bigger picture what about ubc as an institution um what is the one thing and try and keep it to one if you can that you wish ubc would do in the gen ai space to make your job easier i.e if one piece of tech could exist or be adopted or if you could do something that perhaps right now you're a little bit restricted by for whatever reasons what would that be joss 
Yeah, well, actually, I have something that's not really a piece of tech, um, but I, I certainly would like to see the university make some effort to compensate faculty for the the workload and burden that they actually have to take on to do a lot of the work to be adjusting to new technologies. Um, given that they did a fully shit job during COVID of, of doing this for us, I don't really have any high hopes, but it's it's something that I would actually like. Fair comment. Anybody else? John. Um, access to tools, um, you know, and, and maybe, you know, I, I, with great deference to others, um, uh, you know, I, I thought one of the positives of COVID, you know, in the law faculty um, uh, before COVID, I was maybe the only open access person and maybe the only person virtually the only person using lecture capture and certainly the only person with open websites um, for my courses. And that's, you know, COVID changed that because my colleagues here embraced the tools. Um, and I know that on the science side, and especially in this panel, you were all acquainted with the tools, but trying to get a bunch of law professors acquainted with the tools, I've seen just a, a huge change. So to me, and it's not for me because, you know, Rich, you and I are trying to develop tools, um, but I think speaking for the art side and speaking for the law faculty, to the extent I'm allowed doing that, creating accessible tools, accessible pedagogic tools with access that have AI built into them um, and doing training um, and education for academics interested in the area. I think we're going to have a boon in that and that will yield better student results and better student learning over time. So again, I find myself on the optimistic side of the uh, the transom here. Elisa or Raymond, I'm really keen to hear because I know you, you're you both very sort of in the tech side of things. Raymond, you've developed a tool. Elisa, you've seen a bunch of stuff get developed. Could either of you maybe add to this perhaps? Uh, I, I definitely think UBC will have some opportunities to have guidance on AI tools. Elisa and I, amongst others, are on many AI panels and committees, and you will be seeing guidelines coming out it may not move as fast as you want, and it may not be as comprehensive as you want, just recognizing the areas moving quickly. But I think that's one way UBC really can contribute because individual instructors, especially people who aren't building tools like we are, are like, well, what do I do? And just give me an idea, make it as simple as Canvas. And it might never be that simple, but at least helping us as instructors get there is something we're all working towards CTLT, CTL, CIO, and I think that's important for faculty broadly, because we want to focus on our disciplines, our students, not on the tools and the AI as much as we can. Yeah, I can I can jump in as well. I think um, the, yeah, the, the thing that I would like to see that would make my job easier is my job right now is really facilitating other people's work in the area of teaching and learning. I'm doing my own, you know, obviously I'll be going back to teaching very soon, but um, but, you know, facilitating other people's work is, is what I think needs to happen. I mean, we are working, as you know, Rich, on, on enabling faculty to be able to do that. We're trying to put something in place so that faculty can, uh, start playing around. So for me, the thing that would make my job easier is if the thing that we're already working on, it was developed, which is, um, which is a sandbox for, uh, for people to be able to play around with Gen AI in a, in a privacy impact approved way um, with data, data care, et cetera. Um, and I think that would be really exciting. That would make a couple of my jobs easier. One of the jobs is, is the, the acting CTLT um, academic director. Um, but my, my slightly more permanent role is uh, director of ISODL, which is the Institute for Scholarship of Teaching and Learning. And I think that there is just a tremendous amount of SODL-ish stuff that needs to happen in this space. I mean, it's just like it, it is just, we have so many pedagogical questions that we need to be able to ask. So getting um, getting a platform for being able to do that scholarly 
investigation is is really vital. And I think we just we need to plunge in honestly to that. And just to your point about about the time, you know, totally agree. I think that this is something where we we think um, there is a there is a sense, of course, that faculty is kind of on retainer and it's just kind of our job to roll with the punches. And I think, you know, there are only so many punches that we can roll with. Um, really being aware of the work that is that needs to go into this um, is is important. I think, you know, with COVID, there was an expectation that it would end um, and that at some point we would no longer be having to do this extra work. But with Gen AI, there's not that same. I mean, some people think it's a fad, but probably it's not going to end. Probably this there this is something that we really do need to take care with and put real time into and maybe take a beat to be able to think okay well how is my field really changing how are assessments changing what are the educational opportunities that we have here with this new technology how can and how can we deliver courses completely differently how can our programs change and doing that not in a panic i mean covid was a panic this doesn't have to be a panic we could take a reasoned approach um where we could in a nicely paced way, think about how, what our next steps are without it boosting our workload through the ceiling in, in such a way that we do it in an exhausted way. I don't think we want the exhausted approach to this. I think we want the intellectual, well thought out approach uh, to this new stage. Uh, Rich, can I just build on that in a very, very specific way? Um, and again, I sort of find myself a little bit on the other side of the transom. The, the thing personally that I'm most excited about in terms of what I would like uh, Gen AI to do for me is teach me how to code. I'm terribly jealous of all of you that you can code. Um, and I keep hearing that maybe I've been teaching... Um, I wrote, I wrote the first book on video game law. I've been teaching a uh, course on video game law here since 2005. Um, and it would be amazing to take um, uh, the, the, the students through during a semester actually building a game that we can then um, analyze the legal problems in relation to. I would love to do that. I think that speaks to a whole bunch of these issues. Um, now, will I be able to do it? What are the extra efforts that I have to put in, that others have to put in? I know there's this wonderful group around the table uh, right now, but and I'm sure I could email all of you and you'll help me, but that's not the point. How do we do it on a structural basis um, so that nobody has to do it off the side of their desk? Um, Elisa, your point, um, because I want that and I'm not the only one. There's probably 30 profs in the law faculty working on research where Gen AI would help them get to a better rule of law result or something that would help access to justice or things like that that are terribly important, a lot more important than building a video game. Um, and they don't know where to begin to get that help. So how do we as UBC provide that structured resource? Thanks, John. That's a, a very interesting and provocative question. Um, for us, coming to you, uh, I, I know you wanted to mention some things. Sort of yeah, so I just wanted to mention that um, I guess in the past, UBC has been very slow in uh, providing guidance and suggestions on cool new things. Like, for example, learning analytics. We were notoriously slow about getting the right data in the hands of the right people to do cool things. Uh, but I think with generative AI, there have been some lessons learned and the right committees have formed that are passing information right down to faculty and students. Uh, so I'll just put in the chat this um, Gen AI UBC.ca. It's a very like top level domain, which which is kind of a signal in itself that this is not going away anytime soon. Uh, and there's these principles of generative AI tools uh, and also some some guide guidance and guidelines. And I found this to be useful in very clear language, not written by lawyers, but written by people for faculty members to kind of adopt. Uh, there's things like appropriate and responsible use, confidentiality of data, plagiarism, risk mitigation. So there's a bunch of things in there that I think are, uh, you know, just to address your point, John, it, it sounds like people want this stuff and this stuff does exist. 
obviously it needs, the word needs to get out and, and I think forums like this are probably a good way to get some of this out. That's it. <laughs> no, I, I, that's, I, I don't think that is it. I think, I think you've nailed it. I think that's, I think, I think you uh, have really raised an interesting point there. Thank you for us. Um, Elisa, we have something similar to that. I mean, just to, to our own horns in terms of CTLT stuff, but. Yeah, yeah. totally. You, I mean, it's your page. <laughs> you should do your own horn about it. Um, I mean, it's a group effort, but it, you know, it's, uh, it's, um, we also have, so to kind of lockstep in with the um, UBC level guidance, uh, there's a constellation of, um, of committees. Uh, so Christina Hendricks is leading uh, together with Tamara Abel from um, UBCO, the, the teaching and learning guidelines. So those will be coming out in a little while as well. So they'll, those will give a, you know, a lens on these guidelines through the teaching and learning frame. Um, and then also we have, yeah, so we're basically trying to support faculty and, 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 and students to, but, you know, CTLT is, is more directly about supporting faculty with thinking about how to do instructional work with this, with this uh, constellation of tools. So we have a page around um, privacy impact assessments, um, for those of you who have never had to deal with privacy impact assessments, that's the process for figuring out whether privacy, um, private information is um, safe when put into these tools. And so any tool that's used or, or required, especially in a teaching and learning context, has to have passed one of these because you can't require students to put private information into something that will just um, sort of overly expose or betray or sell or whatever their private information. Um, and it's sort of a corollary is the, is the data protection, there's the intellectual property protection around that. Um, so yeah, so we have a page about PIA approvals for the teaching and learning space. Um, nothing is green lit fully right now. So Copilot is, is as close to green as we get, I think. ChatGPT 3.5 has some positive aspects. Uh, so you can go read more about what you're allowed to require to some extent in class. Um, at the moment, and this changes all the time as terms of reference change. So, keep keep an eye on that page. I would say, please do. We we try to update it as fast as we possibly can. So, I'm going to try and move to a couple of questions that we've had uh, from the uh, for attendees here. So, um, I, I don't necessarily know who to go direct this to. So, please jump in if you think you can have an answer for this. So. The first question is, a lot of this discussion has been on encouraging or guiding our students to use generative AI, but we also want to encourage our students to build the next generation of Gen AI tools. That's a question. Uh, not just computer science students, but all students. And um, what can we do to encourage this? John? In, in law, um, there's a giant rule of law problem known as access to justice. Um, currently working within the faculty to see if we can create um, sort of a, a legal tech um, a curriculum and approach that might help us uh, e uh, create access to justice tools. So I think, you know, the more specific we can get in all our areas around problem solving um, and the more we can get experience and then move on to the next problem. Uh, certainly in law, and I suspect in all of our subjects, there's no end to the number of problems. So let's sort of pick the first one and then move to the next one and the next one, and the next one. So getting the ball going is, is I think the most important thing, at least in my area. Would anybody else like to add to that? Bro. So I'll jump in next and, and say that there were a couple of programs that came out of COVID that I was very excited about. One of them was about students as partners. And I think this is a space that would perfectly align uh, um, with the question here about what we can do to help students uh, be more participatory in this, in this design of the next tool. Uh, and I think we have lots of ML and AI faculty and various departments across campus, um, if we could find ways to for UBC to support those faculty and, in, in, you know, incentivizing or giving them credit or course releases uh, to participate in projects like these. I know that there's lots of hackathons on campus, but what you need, you can't just have people go in and randomly start hacking away at stuff. They're just going to build crap and it's going to add noise to the 
to the to, to what's already out there. But I think that if you go in with a specific purpose of, hey, what if I want to have something that analyzes my syllabus to answer questions about it? Like that's a very constrained thing that would be very beneficial to a lot of students. Uh, and if you could build a large language model around just that, that would be a good, you know, con constrained project that many people, not just coders, could contribute to. Uh, but we need to incentivize the research faculty to do this kind of work on locally in our own communities, rather than all the other cool stuff they do that gets that that actually does uh, impact their tenure and promotion cases and things like that, right? Yeah, I can jump in on that as well. I think there's a, um, like, I, I totally agree that everybody needs to be able to build on top of these tools. I think there is a, there is um, something that happens in, in any automated platform, like computing, any computing platform, which this is one of, um, where it takes a certain amount of time to build the bedrock for, um, more user what you know sort of user level programming or something at higher level uh, higher level programming so you don't have to be a low level programmer to be able to um to do a thing so actually computer scientists come out medium level programmers none of us are really that great anymore at programming directly on a machine we do take a course in it maybe but also maybe it's not even a required course anymore i, I don't know um and gradually we're moving up layers of abstraction um, it used to be that you almost had to be a programmer to be able to make a web page, and now you don't because there's like WordPress and all kinds of ways that you can make web pages without knowing anything about the code that runs a web page. And I think that's what we need to wait for to some extent for um, to be able to have that access piece where I think we're already starting to see these things where you can make a teaching, a tutor area bot, or you can make a curriculum, whatever, or you can do a, you know, they're already starting to proliferate. I wouldn't be surprised if once some themes emerge, it will be clear. Like WordPress would not have been possible in the very beginning days of the web because it was not clear at all what people wanted to be able to do with a web page. It would all have just been rainbow spinning letters if it was created then. Um, but now it's like, oh, I see. We want blocks and we want them to be able to move around and we want them to be able to pull from places. And the, basically the operations that are required by users are still not known because we're in such early days. Uh, but they will become known. Um, and, and at that point, then there will be sort of higher level, more abstract tools that people can use for making their own bespoke contributions to the world. Um, so I really look forward to that. And I think, you know, it is probably computer scientists jobs at the moment to make those middleware layers. Um, but then it will open up more generally to people to be able to do incredibly creative stuff on top of it. As a, as a, a capstone to all this, I guess, it reminds me of uh, an analogy that I heard in terms of when uh, personal computers really first started to become a thing. People would sort of see them and hear of them and then just be like, yeah, but isn't it just a glorified calculator? Like, isn't it something that, like, wh wh why would it be useful to me? I don't understand that. And then one of the first really big use cases was a uh, an accountant was basically looking at all of the spreadsheets that he was doing but daily handwriting these spreadsheets and spending 35 40 45 hours a week on these things it's like this sounds like something like these newfangled computers could do uh so then spent some time essentially made the first version of what we now have as excel uh and then showed it to other accountants who for the first and possibly last time in history were like oh here's some money for you because that sounds like a fantastic thing to do i'd like to also be able to do that and it's that scenario that we're in, I think, right now. We're still in that point of people are not see people are waiting for the answers to the question of what can large language models, what can generative AI do for me? I don't know what that is right now. And we need that that accountant, I guess. And I think we're all in that, we're all in that period now where we're trying to find out ourselves what these things can do for us. And I think at the university anyway, the way, the way that I think we're positioned is that we're in a really fantastic position to actually be those accountants in this regard. We can show folks what you can do in this space and help them once, I mean, nowadays we look at computers and if you get any kind of problem, basically our first response is to go to a computer to try and work out what to do with it. 
I suspect that's my belief is that that's going to happen with generative AI at some point in the future. That will be something that we will, AI maybe in general, that we start to rely on more broadly. And, and the folks in this room uh, are all part of that. And I want to thank you very, very deeply for all being here. You've been fantastic. Uh, I know we've had a bunch of questions that, we've had several questions that have come in the Q&A that we haven't managed to have time to get to, but I will work on answers to them for you. Uh, and we'll post a, a replay session of this session and we'll add stuff to that in terms of the questions that's coming in. One last piece, and this is gonna sound slightly strange. I understand that, but I'm going to ask you all the same question again, and I'm looking at the attendees. I'm going to ask the same poll that we asked 45 minutes ago. I don't expect to see change in terms of people have suddenly listened for 45 minutes and all of a sudden have completely changed their opinions. However, what we have seen in the past, in the previous times that we've run this, is that sometimes there is small movement and that small movement might happen. And it might, I'm trying, I, the, the concept is to try and encourage or maybe hope, it's a hope rather than encourage, that you've either learned some, something new to be anxious about, which is not a bad thing, or you've learned something new that you might be inspired by or is something to be maybe excited about or maybe you see an opportunity. So I'm going to open the same poll. And, I, I, and maybe we'll see a difference. I don't know. We'll see. But there we go. Uh, you should all answer the exact same question that we asked 45 minutes ago. And I'll share the results. Like I said, I don't expect to see change. Um, one of the questions in the in the Q and A was about the PIA, um, the the PIA report around Copilot. Um, that right now, it links to an interim report. I think um, interim reports. It just means initial report, really. Um, it's an iterative process, so it doesn't remain forever interim, but it will be interim for a bit longer. <laughs> so, but it is the guidance that is that is needing to be that that is being followed right now. So um, you can feel a sense of confidence about it. <laughs> it's just that there's a lot of a lot of terms of reference to read, a lot of two point fonts. So, um, but that's the the first step. Okay, I'm going to end this before we get we run out of time. And it'd be really interesting to see where we're at. Can I, can I say, can I show both? 21, 6, 62, 12. Let me see. 21. Nearly identical. I think it is nearly identical. Yeah. But there is a slight change, I think. So that's really interesting. So it may, I mean, I think there is a slightly different number of people. No, way more are, people are excited, I think. I think, I think there are, I yeah. think there are yeah, and, a couple And less things. pure anxiety, I think. A little <laughs> less. Yeah. So it's really interesting. So... Okay, that's that's the end of our time. Panelists, thank you all so much for being here. I know this has been a large effort. It's a big lift from all of your parts. I really appreciate it. And folks in the audience, thank you all so much for being here too. I know I've personally really enjoyed it and I hope you have too. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, thank you for having us. Thanks. Thank you.